I think we'll call that an expectant hush. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pip Nicholson and I'm the current Dean of the Melbourne Law School. And by saying current, that's not an indication that I intend to leave anytime soon. It is my very particular pleasure tonight to welcome you to the 2019 Francis Gurry Lecture on Intellectual Property. There are a few people that I would like to acknowledge. I would particularly like to acknowledge IPTA, the Institute for Patent, uh, Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia, co-presenter of the event, and generous event sponsors, IP Australia, AIPPI Australia, IPSANS, and LES ANZ. In case you haven't realised, tonight's event is being filmed and photographed. If you have any objection, can you please let our videographer know? Uh, the proceedings are being live streamed, so if this is an issue for you, can I suggest you move to the outer reaches of the audience? Can I also note it's not usually an issue for people? Um, can I, however, though, entreat you to turn off your mobile phones. Um, very many of us forget that uh, and it would be great if they didn't go off during what I'm sure will be a wonderful lecture. As many of you know, tonight's event is part of this, a series of Francis Gary lectures on intellectual property. In fact, the series was established 10 years ago by Melbourne Law School in conjunction with IPTA. It is named, obviously, in honour of the law school's distinguished alumnus, Dr Francis Gurry, a former lecturer here and current Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organisation. I want to make a short remark about our speaker tonight before I hand over to someone to introduce him to you. Sam Rickardson uh, retired from the law school this year and we welcome him back as a lecturer very shortly after that retirement. I said at his farewell that I expected Sam would remain very active in the area. I think I underestimated the activity at that time, although I'm quite sure Andrew was already fully onto this. So it is, of course, tonight a very particular pleasure to bring that for me and for the school as a whole, that we bring our former colleague, Professor Emeritus Sam Rickardson, back to the school. And I will now invite Christine Emmanuel, IPTA counsellor, to introduce Sam Rickardson a little more thoroughly. Thank you very much, Christine. I'm not so sure it will be more thorough. I was asked to keep it simple, but um, I am really proud and, and a great privilege to be able to introduce you. Um, <clears throat> it, I think Professor Emeritus, Sam Ricketson, I think can be called a heavy hitter in the IP profession, um, to say the least, and really is a, um, in the kind of legacy of the speakers that we've had, that we've had some very high caliber ones. The inaugural one was obviously Francis Gurry back in 2009. And we've had some, some significant speakers. We've had presidents of um, EPO, uh, Alison Brimlow. We've had uh, Robert French, Chief Justice of uh, the High Court of Australia. But for me, um, Sam Ricketson does hold a, a more personal uh, meaning and I brought a little prop. I mean, he's obviously known nationally and internationally, and he's a, an eminent uh, player in the profession, but this actually meant a lot. This is probably the very first um, manuscript that I picked up in my study of intellectual property. And um, I think all students, most students that are students of intellectual property will have Sam Ricketson on their shelves <laughs> somewhere. Um, <clears throat> hopefully not in a box that hasn't been looked at for a while, which as in the commercial function at CSIRO, I think I've, uh, I haven't picked up a manuscript for a while, but 
These are the things that mean a lot to many people in the profession and I think um, makes you perhaps more of a household name in the household that is IP. So <clears throat> you've obviously held academic positions and here at the University of Melbourne, at Monash University, at the University of London, um, engaged in legal practice as a barrister and many other roles and as a consultant to the Australian Law Reform Commission. And it's really in that role to which you will speak for our current topic. And so I will ask you now to speak on um, IP law reform in Australia, warts and all. Professor Emeritus Sam Ricketson, please welcome. Thank you very much, Pip, and thank you, Christiane. That's uh, uh, very kind of you, and I'm greatly honoured to be here this evening uh, to be able to give this lecture. Uh, very grateful to IPTA and to all the sponsors and to my old law school, my still law school. Uh, I should just say something about the person after whom the lecture is named, Francis Gary. Uh, he would be known to you all, uh, but he and I were in fact students at the same time and uh, uh, colleagues in the law school at the early stages of our uh, academic careers. And he then moved on uh, to other fields and He's now, of course, Director General of uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, under his uh, Director Generalship, the organization, I think, has grown. It's moved into many different areas, and uh, it's really one of the most interesting uh, organizations in the United Nations system. And Francis is uh, the most senior Australian in that system, and he also plays a part in that system above and beyond WIPO. I'd also like to make very brief mention of two other Australians who have been eminent in the area of intellectual property. Uh, again, these will be names that you will be very familiar with. Uh, one is Professor Bill Cornish, who uh, originally is from South Australia, but began uh, teaching intellectual property at LSC in the late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, then subsequently at the University of Cambridge. And uh, he has taught uh, many students from all over the world, including from this country, including members of our federal court. Uh, and he is one of the leading academic uh, writers and commentators on intellectual property in uh, the United Kingdom. The other person that I mentioned is uh, the late Jim Lahore, who is really one of the pioneers in intellectual property uh, in this country as well as in the United Kingdom. Uh, he began uh, teaching uh, intellectual property uh, at Monash uh, at a very early stage in the late 1960s uh, and uh, subsequently uh, founded the intellectual property postgraduate programs in the University of London. Uh, he then uh, taught in our program here for many years. Uh, Jim uh, was someone who was uh, a fine scholar. Uh, he was the author of the first uh, copyright text in this country. And his name, of course, will be familiar to all of you uh, in the two services that bear his name and the marks of his uh, continuing scholarship. Uh, also, as the founder of uh, the Intellectual Property Reports, which, of course, we all use uh, on a daily basis. Uh, in addition, he was a leading practitioner in intellectual property and as well, he, he was uh, a member of a number of the reform uh, bodies that I'm going to be talking about today and played a very significant uh, role in IP law reform in this country. So I'd like to pay particular uh, tribute to Jim because I worked with him in London in the 1980s. We were very close at that stage but he was a, a wonderful model to people working in the intellectual property area. Now, having reached that point, I have to start my topic and I have to realize that I uh, got exactly where I want to be. Uh, the, the topic uh, that I wanted to address tonight was uh, intellectual property uh, law reform. Uh, and it is a story of mixed successes and failures. Uh, but 
Before I talk about some of those successes and failures, I'd like also to talk about a, a broader topic, which is uh, Australia's uh, ongoing concern with the promotion of innovation and creativity. I'd link both of those things together, and I must say I'm going to proceed on the assumption that we think those are good things, that we should be aiming to be innovative and we should be aiming to be creative, and in fact they form part of a, a continuum. Uh, the issue of innovation and creativity has been around for a long time, but uh, there is a poem by Henry Lawson written in the 1890s. I don't recommend you read the whole of it because it has some otherwise politically incorrect views. But there is uh, an, an ironic comment that he makes there, uh, talking, I think, with reference to a young uh, colonial society that was emerging from being an agricultural primary industry economy to one where it was beginning to industrialise and to do things and to make things. And he talked about a new generation has arisen under Australian skies, born to be thinkers and doers and makers of wonderful things. Well, uh, that may have been said ironically in that he thought this might be going to happen, but indeed there's not been much said about that at official levels uh, and government levels in the years that followed uh, up until about the late 1970s, early 1980s. And then the word innovation, coupled with creativity on occasion, have become a, a leitmotiv that have been repeated constantly by uh, politicians. And I've just noted some of them, and they'll bring back memories for some of you who are old enough to remember uh, people like uh, Prime Minister Hawke in his election campaign in 1990, where he spoke about the clever country, which was a reference, I think, back in an ironic way to... Uh, the lucky country of uh, uh, Donald Horne, and indeed Barry Jones had, I think, uh, shaped that in a slightly different way a little later by talking about the intelligent country and the need for us to be aware of the uh, implications of technology and the way it would change workforce and the way that we did things. Uh, but the same concern with uh, innovation and creativity continued under Keating, and there was, as you recall, uh, the creative nation statement which uh, his government made that was particularly concerned with the place of uh, culture and the arts and the place of uh, creativity there. But there are also interesting reports that were done during his prime ministership by a, a new body uh, set up, the Engineering and Science Council, and then there was later a National Information Council was set up, which did talk in much more detail about innovation and what was required. And subsequently, under John Howard, in 1999-2000, uh, there was a National Innovation Summit uh, and there was a, an official statement that came out a little later called Backing Australia's Ability. And uh, the same theme was continued uh, with the newly elected Labor government in 2008-2009. Uh, there were some wonderfully named documents that played upon this theme, Venturous Australia, which was an independent consultant's report to government, and a more official one, which was called Powering Ideas, that was produced in 2009. Each of these emphasised the need for the country to become innovative, moving ahead, casting off the shackles of uh, traditional economies and traditional structures. And of course, when Malcolm Turnbull became uh, Prime Minister in uh, December 2015, he released a, a much vaunted uh, innovation statement which had the wonderful title of Welcome to the Ideas Boom. Now, the reason I just mention uh, these uh, large, larger than life sort of general statements by government about innovation and creativity is that one might go on to say, well, what's necessary to promote those goals? And of course, one of the things that's important are the laws that implement those goals. And IP laws are a very important component in all of this. Now, the interesting thing is that IP laws, for the most part, were only mentioned in passing in any of these uh, grand visions, these grand statements that were made by uh, successive governments. Uh, there was, in fact, a much more detailed one that was prepared at the time of the Keating government by the Prime Minister's Science and Engineering Council, and likewise, 
as part of the Innovation Summit in 2000. But generally, IP was seen as uh, uh, a lever that you might pull once you decided what your policy objectives were and how you were going to promote innovation, along with other things like taxation, research incentives, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, but it's even interesting that in the most significant statement of recent years, which was that of Turnbull in 2015, there was actually no mention of IP at all and the need for IP laws and what one might do with them. Uh, talked about tax incentives and uh, uh, changes the corporate laws dealing with Phoenix companies and startups and the like, but not IP. But my point is simply that the laws are important, that if you do have objectives, and assuming these objectives to be good ones, to promote innovative activity and creative activity, you need to have uh, laws that will achieve that. And that does lead to, hopefully, the next slide. <laughs> uh, how seriously do we take those laws? And in one level, I think we had taken them seriously. At another level, uh, we've approached in a rather ad hoc way. Uh, a question to be asked is, uh, what are the goals that we have in the IP laws that we're developing? Do we always address the particular interests that they're serving or might be affecting? Uh, how do we deal with the question of balancing competing interests? Uh, another issue which flows on from that is what evidence do we seek uh, when we go about uh, reviewing what those laws should be and how we might achieve the goals of innovation through those laws. There's all sorts of evidence, of course, as you'll be aware. There's uh, lots of evidence you can get in the patent filings, trademark registrations and the like. But there's a lot of other evidence, which I think is also important, which is uh, how people react to particular laws, whether they will react positively or negatively. And in the immediate case of those who want to use those laws, uh, what is their attitude to them? And some of that evidence is very hard to obtain because it does uh, involve a certain amount of anecdotal evidence, but uh, survey evidence and like, and that's expensive uh, to obtain. But unless you do have a fairly good grasp on what's happening out there and what the effect of your proposals might be, uh, you may find that you've uh, uh, really gone down a dead end. Uh, that leads to a related question is, Assuming that we can get the evidence right and we can get the proposals right that will advance the goals that we've decided, um, do we pay enough attention to how we translate those policies into law? Uh, it's the how which is an issue that always concerns me, and I suppose that's inevitable being a lawyer. Uh, how carefully do we think about the drafting and the shape of our laws? Uh, are they just to be addressed to lawyers? It's a great thing. Of course, as a former member of the bar, it was always fun to find uh, different statutory provisions that you could play with. But really, the law should be uh, capable of being readily appreciated by any user of the system and any person of the, in the public should be able to understand them. That's an obvious theme that one might uh, apply through all areas of law. But IP law, I think, is a, a very good example. And finally, there is the issue of aligning uh, domestic laws and goals with uh, those that arise uh, internationally. And we do operate in an international environment uh, that has uh, negative uh, aspects to it in the sense that our international obligations, of which we have many, uh, place some restraints on us. Some of them are what you might call very hard boundaries. You can't move beyond them. Uh, others are much more flexible. And I tend to think that the flexibilities of the boundaries are much more uh, in evidence than one might at first think. There are a lot of things that can be done at domestic level that would still be consistent with international obligations if one is creative and thoughtful enough about that. And there is, of course, the positive aspect that uh, I think uh, we sometimes ignore, which uh, uh, if we are good citizens in this regard and promote good laws, that has a flow-on effect internationally to those with whom we trade, those with whom we deal, and uh, we are, in fact, playing our part as part of that international order, which is exactly what Francis is doing as uh, Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization in trying to achieve good laws 
at the international level in the form of treaties and other uh, norm formulation activities. Now, all that's by way of very general background. Uh, innovation, uh, the problems that arise. Uh, what does our history show us? Well, I have on that rather elegant slide uh, given you a brief potted overview of the history of intellectual property laws and law reform over the past 119 years. Um, I mentioned uh, a moment ago when I uh, referred to Henry Lawson that uh, he was writing in the 1890s. Um, and after that, really no one was talking about these issues very much. Uh, one of the oddities that uh, amuses me, I don't know the answer to this, is that when uh, the Commonwealth Constitution was being drafted, uh, there was a decision made to insert as one of the heads of power for the new Commonwealth Parliament, uh, legislative power to, uh, for the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws with respect to registered copyright, uh, registered intellectual property rights, namely copyright, which was a registered right in those days, uh, patents for inventions, designs and trademarks. There's no explanation whatsoever to be found in any of the pre Federation debates, and there are a lot of debates that preceded the adoption of the Commonwealth Constitution, but there were no debates at all about why this particular thing should go to the Commonwealth Parliament. One can only assume that this was thought to be, quote, a good thing, because there were already uh, six sets of colonial laws existing in these particular areas. They were largely clones of UK models, but it was a, an easy and non-contentious issue to put it into the hands of the Commonwealth Parliament. And indeed, the Commonwealth Parliament was not slow in picking up uh, those particular uh, laws. They enacted a, a patent law in 1903, a trademarks law in 1905, designs in 1906, uh, copyright, interestingly, in 1905, and then again in 1912. For the most part, these were uh, just uh, copies of corresponding UK legislation. Uh, there was no particular consideration in depth of uh, whether these laws were good in the Australian environment, whether they were going to promote particular objectives in Australia that might be different from those of the mother country. They were there in a sort of ready to wear uh, form that could be adapted over. There was one uh, slight breakout in the Trademarks Act, you might remember, the uh, workers' marks were uh, an introduction that had a US uh, origin rather than uh, uh, one from the United Kingdom, but they were very rapidly afterwards uh, shot down by the High Court in the Union Label case, which remained a very significant um, uh, authority for many years on the scope of the trademarks power. Uh, in the case of copyright, there was also a slight aberration uh, for a, a short while because uh, copyright in the UK at that time was the subject of 17 different acts. Uh, the great virtue of the 1905 Copyright Act was it put them all into one and came up with actually what was quite a short, elegant copyright code. But it only remained in force for a very short period of time. It also ran concurrently with the now state copyright laws, which made it a bit confusing. But in 1911, the UK did actually adopt one single Copyright Act, which was the 1911 Act, which had potential imperial application. And immediately that happened, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament adapted that and applied it to Australia as a schedule to the 1912 Copyright Act. And the interesting thing is that that happened with a number of countries of the former British Empire and the later Commonwealth uh, that applied the uh, uh, 1911 Act uh, and it really did become a piece of imperial legislation. But it wasn't Australian, and there was no real discussion at any stage as to why that might be uh, appropriate, uh, whether there might be differences so far as Australia was concerned. Things slumbered for a while after that, and you could imagine why. There were lots of other things going on, world wars, depression, etc. But there was a, a committee that was appointed in the late 1930s under the then Solicitor General, uh, uh, Sir George Knowles. Uh, a very small committee uh, with a, a patent attorney representative and a legal representative. Um, 
And they were asked to uh, review both the uh, patents legislation as it was and the trademarks legislation, bearing in mind there'd been virtually no changes to any of those acts since they were enacted some 35 years earlier. Uh, it's interesting to note the work of this particular committee uh, because it's very obvious that this uh, committee saw its task as a, a technical and limited one, not one that involved them carrying out what we now call consultations, receiving public submissions. Uh, and it was particularly at pains to point out that they should look at what had happened in the United Kingdom, and quite a bit had happened in the interim period, and they should revise Australian law upwards and accordingly uh, without any particular attention being given to whether or not this was appropriate in the Australian environment. So there is a quote here from uh, the uh, Knowles Committee, this in relation to patents, but it was similar in relation to trademarks. From a practical viewpoint, uh, it, is also, it, it is desirable that British inventors and, their, uh, inventors and their advisors should not be troubled about differing laws and that Australian inventors and their advisors should be similarly assisted by uniformity. We have therefore accordingly represent, uh, recommended the adoption of very many of the provisions of the existing British Act. They also went on to say there's been all this law reform activity in the United Kingdom. They've had submissions and so forth there. Uh, let's free ride on what's been done. And uh, what's good enough for them is obviously good enough for us. So uh, I, I thought it's a wonderful quote to have. Uh, they did an interesting thing, however. They, they were a very low-cost committee. They did this by correspondence mainly between Canberra and Melbourne. Uh, they did uh, append a draft bill. They had a parliamentary draftsman who came along and worked with them as well. Uh, they appended a draft bill to the report. Uh, World War II intervened, so nothing happened, as you can imagine. And in the meantime, other things had happened in the UK system. So there was another uh, similarly constituted and small expert committee under Sir Arthur Dean that was appointed, uh, and that reviewed what the Knowles Committee had done and looked at what has subsequently happened in the UK, and it made recommendations essentially that these should be followed in Australian law. So again, it was a, a, a follow the leader uh, approach. And so that led it pretty quickly to legislation, the 52 Copyright Act, which was pretty closely modelled on the 49 UK Act, uh, the 55 Trademarks Act, which is pretty closely uh, modelled on the uh, 1938 UK Act. Uh, so that was really the uh, uh, story of patents and trademarks up to that point. Uh, there was a slight difference in relation to uh, copyright. Uh, the 1911 Act had remained uh, in place for a number of years, obviously, in the UK, but in the UK, in the early 1950s, they had a review of it under uh, Gregory. And that led to a number of significant uh, proposals for change, particularly taking account of technological developments with broadcasting and other uh, things that had developed. Uh, and it also had to take account of some of the changes at the international level. So after that was enacted in 1956, uh, the Commonwealth Attorney General uh, set up another committee under Sir John Spicer, who was a former Attorney General, but by this stage a judge of the Industrial Court, and uh, uh, asked him and his committee, which was slightly more broadly based than uh, the patents ones. It had a publisher on it, for example, and a music academic, a member of this university. Uh, and in fact, the secretary of the committee was uh, uh, prof uh, later Professor Leslie Zions, who was working uh, as uh, a, a, an officer of the Attorney General's Department at that time. And this, in fact, was a committee that, while it was closely bound or looked to what the Gregory Committee in the 1956 Act had achieved in the UK, uh, nonetheless was very conscious that things were changing in Australia and began to look more broadly and sought submissions, received them, and very extensive submissions from all sorts of areas, people using the copyright system, uh, people that were affected by it in the broadcasting, education, library sectors, and came up with a report that while, by and large, it recommended something along the lines of the 56 UK Act, did have some uh, Australian tweaks. Uh, it's an interesting development at this stage because uh, 
it took some time for that legislation to be enacted. In the 1952 Patents Act, for example, the Dean Committee report had been received at the end of 1950. It was enacted in 52, pretty quickly, went straight through to the keeper. In the case of the uh, Spicer Committee report, there was about seven to eight years elapsed. And I think what the documents begin to show is that this was the first time it became transparent that there were such things called interest groups and lobby groups that began to uh, lobby the relevant minister, who was the Attorney General. And uh, they began to put forward things that they wanted in this new legislation. And to some extent, I think uh, they, they were successful. So the result was the 1968 Act, which was our first Indigenous uh, Copyright Act. In the case of designs, designs is one of those areas that sort of sleeps and slept for many years, perhaps because no one really understood what it was about, or as one uh, judge described it, as uh, Justice Dixon, a, a, a peculiar act. There were very few cases dealing with it, uh, and it was not a much-used system. Uh, but there were, in fact, changes in the United Kingdom and quite significant change that occurred in 1949. So lo and behold, uh, a number of years later, it wasn't until the early 70s, so time, it took time in this area for things to move, uh, there was an expert committee appointed under uh, Justice Frankie. And that is the kind of committee that we'd much more readily rec uh, recognise today. It was a small committee with... Uh, other specialist members, but it did conduct hearings and it received evidence and public submissions. And uh, while it had a weather eye to what had happened in the UK, it did actually depart from those uh, provisions in the UK in a number of ways and ultimately produced a report that was uh, something that was much more attuned, when it was said, viewing it uh, at least uh, from the surface, that this was much more attuned to Australian conditions. Uh, a further reference was given to uh, Justice Frankie, which led to another report, uh, which was whether or not we should have some kind of second tier uh, patent protection or a utility model, as it's known in a number of European laws. And that also uh, was a, a carefully researched and considered report. And there was quite a lot of submissions received uh, on the need for this form of protection that would be something less than full patent protection. Needless to say, uh, both of those reports lingered for a while before parts of them were ultimately enacted, the amendments to the Zions Act in 1980, but not completely what Justice Frank had recommended. Uh, utility models transformed or transnamed themselves as petty patents in 1980 and then subsequently transmuted into what we now know and we'll say goodbye to shortly, uh, innovation patents. So uh, these were uh, really uh, interesting law reform efforts, but within relatively narrow compass. And indeed, the photocopying one, which did lead more quickly to legislation, was an example of uh, a particular problem that had arisen, uh, largely because of what was going on in universities, uh, copying things. Uh, there had been high court uh, litigation about it, and uh, ultimately uh, there was this uh, fa fairly extensive inquiry by Justice Frankie again, uh, and that did lead to amendments to the uh, Copyright Act being made in, in 1980, uh, the educational uh, statutory licences. However, these all seem to be uh, curtain raises to what always seems to me to be the big event, uh, and that was uh, the reference that was given to another committee, uh, which was called the Industrial Property Advisory Committee in 1979 by, and I think this is a very <coughs> <coughs> pertinent name for the minister, who's then the Minister for Productivity, uh, Ian McPhee, which was uh, to review the patent system. Uh, and the terms of reference were really quite general to study from the viewpoint of the Australian national interest, whether the Australian patent system as presently operating sufficiently advances Australia's technological development and whether there are ways in which it may be made to do so more effectively. And then it uh, said you can look at this as widely as you wish, look at uh, change that might be necessary administratively, what might be a constraint that applies uh, uh, internationally. And most significantly, the membership of the committee 
which did have um, uh, very expert people from the patent attorney uh, legal profession and the Commissioner of Patents, of course. Uh, it also had uh, as chair uh, John Stonier, uh, who is a lawyer, but also uh, someone who's very experienced in industry. And uh, it had an economist. And uh, it carried out its review. Uh, these essentially were part-time uh, co committee members, but they put an enormous amount of work into it, and they commissioned reports. They commissioned reports from economists on the effects of the patent system. Uh, they commissioned um, uh, reports from lawyers, and one of them sitting here, Anne Dufty, in relation to uh, patentability standards. So they got some really expert technical advice and economic uh, input in making uh, up their final report. The final report, of course, is interesting when you compare some of the ones that have later emerged because it's only 84 pages long, but it's very succinct. And uh, it uh, is the first time that I think a committee had engaged with the wider issues of what the patent system uh, should be about. Now, it, it did uh, even raise in some of its early consultation the more controversial question of whether we should have a patent system. And may I just say, uh, that's not as radical as it might sound because that was a major issue in a number of countries in the 19th century. Even in the UK, there was a strong anti-patent group. Uh, in Europe, it was a problem as well. The Netherlands abolished its patent system in the late uh, 1860s and uh, Prussia, which before it became the German Empire, considered abolishing the patent system as well because they saw it as a restraint on uh, uh, competition and on innovation. So the report of the IPAC committee, which was again tellingly entitled Patents, Innovation and Competition in Australia, is really a landmark as to the way in which uh, wider reform activities can be conducted. Uh, there was, uh, interestingly, uh, and I'm sure it must have annoyed the majorities on the committee, uh, a dissenting report by The Economist, which came in almost at the last time. And uh, he said, and, uh, and the dissent is worth reading because he said, this is not an imaginative report. It hasn't gone far enough. You haven't really done what you should have done. It's great stuff to read. And as I say, it must have annoyed those who were working on the committee and who thought they had looked at all these issues and were making balanced and reasonable uh, recommendations, but at the same time, what it is is a breath of fresh air that there was some dissent, there was some discussion of uh, the broader issues, and I think that was a, a, a real landmark in our IP reform processes. Uh, what's happened after that? Well, I can go through it fairly quickly, but the problem is, as Andrew Christie has actually sketched in a very interesting article, there's been a plethora of uh, law reform inquiries uh, from 1980 on. And I can only give you a, a, a sense of what they are. And you'll probably know some of them or you've heard of them. You said, oh, yes, I remember that. Or uh, I'm surprised that they had an inquiry and I never heard about it. But a starting point is that there were two standing committees that came into existence in the 1980s. IPAC became a standing committee and conducted a number of uh, inquiries into areas, perhaps not quite as broad as the patent system, but subjects like character merchandising, uh, business names and company names, uh, enforcement, importation provisions. These are all important issues within and across IP regimes. Um, it was replaced, as you'll be aware, after it came to an end in 1992, but then was replaced by ACIP, a somewhat more broadly a based uh, committee in terms of membership uh, in 1994, which in turn conducted a number of important inquiries, matters as significant as the innovation uh, patent, uh, the designs, review of the design system, and so forth. So there's a number of uh, things that flowed out of that. Uh, in the copyright area, there was a similar standing committee that was appointed, which was the Copyright Law Review Committee, and that was in 1983. And over its 22 years of existence, it too uh, carried out some very important inquiries. Some of them are narrow in scope. For example, journalists' copyright, which was very controversial. Uh, church music, perhaps less so. The meaning of publication, 
a technical issue, but one of some importance. But some really broad-ranging issues, for example, simplification of the Copyright Act, uh, computer software, how that should be treated. And that, I might say, I didn't bring it along, it's a much bigger report than that. Um, and uh, in the early 2000s, uh, copyright and contracts uh, and crown copyright, all pretty weighty and important subjects uh, and significant reports came out of those reviews. In the area of plant breeders' rights, there was an advisory committee appointed under statute which also produced uh, uh, some reports. Now, uh, there are members of some of these committees I know in, in the audience and you will have your own perspectives uh, on what and how those committees worked. I'll make a couple of comments in a moment about uh, what, what they did. But uh, for good or bad, and I would say for bad, uh, none of them exist today. Uh, the CLRC came to an end in 2005. The ACIP uh, came to an end in 2015, possibly as an unintended consequence of that rather strange National Audit Commission, which was uh, concerned with uh, uh, getting rid of uh, unnecessary uh, regulatory and advisory bodies in the Commonwealth level. Uh, a payback was actually... Uh, abolished by statute as was a statutory body in 2018. In the case of ACIP and uh, IPAC and before that IPAC, they were relatively easy bodies to constitute because they weren't done under statute and much easier bodies, I guess, to discontinue because there was no statutory amendment required. But alongside, in addition to all the work of those sta uh, standing committees, and they were a a pretty fair body of reports from those committees alone. Um, there were any number of ad hoc reviews uh, by external consultants, a number of those particularly in the area of copyright, but you'll find them in patents as well. Uh, external uh, ad hoc committees. Uh, there was a notable one by uh, Professor Lahore on designs, and I'll come back to that in a moment because it does raise a very particular issue. Um, there were also uh, reports and, uh, in fact, legislation was generated from in-house committees within uh, IP Australia or the relevant government departments. And I just mentioned two, uh, the Trademarks Working Party in relation to uh, trademarks law and, more recently, uh, the work that was done in-house with respect to preparation of the Raise in the Bar Amendments for, uh, came in in 2012. Um, you can see the same sort of in-house work going on in the copyright area at the moment within the communications and arts uh, department. Um, there were also uh, some references uh, to intellectual property matters by a number of regulatory authorities uh, which looked at these issues with a particular eye, notably the former Trade Practices Commission and the ACCC. And indeed, by a number of parliamentary committees. So, if you actually were to line up physically all these reports, they do take uh, about two shelves on an average office. And this is not good in the uh, online digital age. And a lot of them aren't available online, I, I go on to, to add. Um, there were also some significant inquiries that were conducted by the Australian Law Reform Commission, which is really the Rolls Royce option when it comes to law reform. And I just mentioned designs, gene patents, and most recently in relation to copyright exceptions. And just as you thought it was safe to go back in the water, there were several significant macro reviews, if I could call it that, or systems reviews. Uh, and I mentioned two of particular significance, uh, the Ergus report, which looked at IP laws generally against the background of national competition law. And... Uh, the Productivity Commission, which not only looked at that sort of issue, but more generally where IP uh, laws and their arrangements fitted in to the overall national economy. So you can see there's been a lot going on. And as I look through my files, I find more and more uh, reports uh, by such bodies as the Bureau of Industry Economics, which may no longer be there, and other small regulatory bodies. So IP has attracted a lot of attention. And there are a lot of things that have been put uh, on, the, on the agenda, so to speak.
So if I had to uh, summarize just in a factual sense what all this means, uh, we've had a lot of activity. Uh, some very high quality reports have been uh, prepared uh, and put to government. Uh, if anything, even if nothing more happens, they are a resource for the future. There have been uh, legislative outcomes from many, not all. Uh, some, I think, have been uh, successful. Uh, in fact, the in-house Trademarks Working Party, I think, is a very good example leading to what is pretty good uh, legislation. Uh, you can see others where there have been clear failures, uh, or where things just haven't happened. Uh, I think what we have ended up doing in relation to second tier patent protection uh, really has not been a great success, as you can see, and we've had three successive reports dealing with that particular matter. And even at the end, now that it's been decided to abolish them, I don't think we've really come to grips with the fundamental question is, do we need such a form of protection? I mean, e even if the existing one doesn't work well, and that might be a, a valid argument on the evidence, uh, is that an end of the discussion? Should there not be some further inquiry into the actual need for such a form of protection? Uh, many of these inquiries have been of a narrow kind or they've been limited in their uh, terms of reference. And the reason I just mentioned that is that uh, I found a, um, a copy in a uh, report that was done by uh, Professor Lahore uh, in relation to designs uh, in the early 90s, which was to look at problems arising out of the amendments that have been made in 1980 to the Designs Act in response to the Frankie Committee uh, recommendations, uh, touching upon, one would have thought, issues of designs copyright overlap, which is like the schwelzig holstein question that no one really quite <laughs> knows what to make of. Uh, and there is a letter appended in the appendix to uh, his report, which I'm sure he put in quite mischievously from the Attorney General's Department, which uh, indicates, well, we have dealt with the copyright aspects and uh, we trust that you'll take that into account in your uh, terms of inquiry as you proceed. In other words, there were two government departments involved and uh, that gives rise to, uh, I think, a much larger issue that I'll come to in a moment. Uh, most of these inquiries have been conducted by part-time experts, people who've given of their time. Uh, I don't think of any criticism of any individuals involved, but they are limited in their time and the resources available in them, to, available to them. They've been dependent upon the relevant government departments to provide them with uh, support. There's been an inevitable time lag between the receipt of the reports by government and government responses, sometimes there's been no response. Things have just lingered and one never knows quite what's happened. Very hard for an outsider perhaps to go behind that and to see uh, whether there has been discussion at governmental level. There's a disconnect between what one might call the macro and the micro levels uh, in that it's very easy to have an Ergus Committee report or a Productivity Commission report that can tell you what's wrong uh, with everything we can make a shopping list, and I think anyone here could perhaps give a list to about 10 or 20 things that need fixing in one way or the other. It's much harder to uh, work out how you would fix those things, and that's where the micro law reform is important, micro law reform leading to uh, legislative change. And, of course, there may even be issues where you don't need to do anything, and that's also an important law reform outcome, isn't it, that you might realise that uh, doing something would be deleterious. Um, there's large ideas that have been put forward in the past and they're lingering there in the reports. For example, uh, the notion of an unfair copying right, which uh, is not uncommon in other countries, particularly in Europe, uh, in the European Union. Uh, and that was floated by uh, Professor Lahore as part of the uh, uh, ALRC designs uh, inquiry. Uh, simplification. Uh, a matter that uh, my colleague Andrew Christie was closely involved in. Uh, there are some very important ideas that were put forward in those reports of the CLRC in the 1990s. And uh, as far as I can tell, they've just simply remained there. No one's really taken them up. Although, to be fair, 
uh, they are picked up to some extent in the inquiry done by uh, Professor McHugh uh, for the ALRC in 2013. And to be fair also to uh, the legislators, they have simplified those dreadful educational copying uh, provisions of the Copyright Act quite considerably in legislation passed uh, uh, several years ago. But perhaps the real issue that stops things working uh, in terms of a flow through of proposals to implementation to ultimate uh, legislation is that there's fragmented administrative responsibility for IP laws in Australia. And uh, the, the picture is slightly better perhaps now than it was uh, when one was looking at this in the 1990s, early 2000s. But there is one body uh, responsible for registration processes, IP Australia, within uh, DIS, which is interestingly named the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. And it has had, had previous acronyms before that, all of which involve industry, but something else, whether technology or science. Uh, the Attorney Generals uh, had uh, carriage for many years of copyright and circuit layouts, but that was then passed to communications and arts department. Uh, and in fact, there's been a bit of a toing and throwing of that, but it was formally put uh, solely into DOCA in 2015. The Agricultural Department, Department of Agriculture, has responsibility uh, for geographic indications, which have important connections, I would have thought, to trademarks. Uh, domain name, names sort of rest done easily um, on the borders of uh, uh, the Department of Communications. Uh, and there are other agencies uh, and departments of government that have a real concern with um, IP, notably the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and uh, Trade in, in relation to FTAs, uh, to the WTO and the like. And of course, we no longer have any independent bodies that are able to carry out uh, research and uh, recommendations on law reform proposals. So to move quickly to uh, a critique of what's wrong in the light of all that, and then how might we make things better. Uh, the preceding side was intended to be factual in that it was simply saying what the situation is. If one had to make comments about it, as you would do at the bottom of any school report, uh, you'd have to say, well, it is messy and chaotic. Uh, the issue of legal and administrative overlaps, I think, is a real problem. Uh, there's a particular problem that would be familiar to any uh, regulatory theory, which is that in IP Australia, there's going to be uh, an overlap between its regulatory roles, its registration roles, and its policy aspects. And I think that has increased over the last few years, particularly with the abolition of the independent uh, review bodies. Uh, there's the issue of drafting of legislation uh, still remains, and I think there will be members of the audience who will have war stories in this regard who will find that there are real problems in being able to translate policy proposals, which may seem clear enough, into legislation, which ends up appearing to be not quite so clear. Um, there are other drafting models available that could uh, be usefully looked at in uh, our laws. Uh, our moral rights amendments are a good example. They take something like 20 pages to implement uh, three paragraphs of uh, Article 6 bis of the Berne Convention. Um, we added to that another 20 pages when we protected moral rights for performers. There's a lot of repetition, uh, and that could be uh, readily removed. Uh, I've referred to one model which is particularly useful in the copyright area, which is uh, a European model copyright law, which is developed by uh, European scholars. That's the Vitam uh, proposal. Uh, and there are lots of model laws to be found in the bowels or the archives of WIPO, which did a lot of work in that regard in the 1960s and 1970s. And they still remain pretty good models of drafting and how one might simplify and yet make meaningful uh, these particular uh, concepts. Um, there are feedback loop problems, which uh, is my way of perhaps trying to show that I know something about technology, but uh, it's simply that there is an issue that has arisen uh, with 
all these standing committees we've had in the past, in fact, almost all the committees, that uh, they might be given a brief to do something, but they are then resourced and funded by the very body which has given them the brief, that is the government department. So even though they're independent, they are dependent upon uh, those resources. And then when they come up with their carefully uh, calibrated and nuanced policy proposals, uh, they go back to government and government then will send them back to the relevant department to provide advice as to what government's response should be. Uh, and that is a little bit of a continuous loop with the snake eating its tail uh, that the responses often are formulated by those who um, were involved at an earlier stage on the uh, development of those proposals, or at least uh, supporting those who were doing that work. There's the further problem, which I think I've already identified sufficiently, which is there are disparate parts of government involved in this area. Uh, how do they uh, coordinate? How do they come together? There's the immense problem of consultation. How do you get appropriate consultation processes going? And in some areas that has clearly been inadequate. It certainly is inadequate in areas like trade, where there's often a lack of uh, transparency when uh, advice is being sought. Who is it? From whom is advice being sought? How is it to be given? Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to know uh, what you're being asked to advise upon and what the actual implications of that will be. And of course, there are the wider international issues that we must have an eye to. Now, just to conclude very briefly, uh, it's all very easy for an academic, particularly retired academic, to say, look, it's all pretty bad. There's been a lot of problems have arisen. There's uh, you know, some real issues here. Uh, how could we do things better? Well, there's no perfect solution to this, um, but I put before you some proposals that might be a good starting point. First of all, it would be good to do away with the divided administrative responsibility we have in this area. Uh, for a start, it would be good to have a single responsible minister, someone who would be a champion for intellectual property within government. And that assumes the starting point that it is accepted that intellectual property and inter good intellectual property laws are something that are worthwhile and will enhance and advance our wider goals in the innovation and creativity area. It would be good to bring all the administrative aspects of IP together within one agency. In this case, it could be uh, IP Australia. Uh, copyright is an obvious outsider and could come in from the cold, so to speak, from communications and arts uh, to IP Australia. Now, one response might be, and this was appealed to the Productivity Commission, who thought this should not happen, um, that uh, copyright's not a registered right. But it does nonetheless have a regulatory aspect to it. The supervision of collecting societies is a good example. Uh, it, it does have some other regulatory roles. And I think all those issues could come together within one uh, departmental or one agency framework particularly as there are so many overlaps between the copyright area and all the other rights, patents, trademarks, designs. Um, it would be good, I think, to further separate uh, out the regulatory roles uh, and the policy roles. Uh, at the moment, they have become more and more grouped within the umbrella of IP Australia, functionally they're put into separate divisions in IP Australia, but it would be desirable to have the policy aspects outside within a department, more generally, perhaps in uh, the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. And there's a lot to be done there uh, when it comes to the task of policy implementation uh, and actually preparing instructions, carrying out policy proposals. But I think that would be further aided by uh, establishing uh, a separate independent IP reform agency. Uh, and this could be something of a standing committee to be separately and better resourced. It could be within the ALRC. Uh, the ALRC has very established uh, procedures for consultation and law reform, but it's a model, but it's important, I think, to have that separate independent agency. Uh, we do need to have some wider body 
that could sit uh, as an advisor to the minister uh, to set what I've called a broader IP uh, agenda. There have been proposals for such bodies uh, in the past, and I think that could be uh, a useful uh, idea. Uh, we need to consider carefully consultative processes, uh, and uh, this was an issue that's been raised with me in an earlier presentation in Sydney. Uh, one needs to think about consultation very carefully, and there might be different forms of consultation depending at what point of the process you're concerned about. Uh, we need to have an international agenda uh, that links into what DFAT is doing, and there are some models for that to be found in Europe. And finally, we might consider once and for all to uh, amend our constitution to give all power over intellectual property matters to the Commonwealth Parliament rather than uh, just the registered rights and copyright as we have at present. If you think that sounds somewhat uh, bizarre, there was a proposal and a recommendation of the Constitutional Commission in 1987 to that effect, and it was a simple recommendation. But it's an issue that I think becomes more important as we enter into free trade agreements where we have to talk about things like trade secrets, which notionally are within state powers, but they have such a close connection to our, in, uh, our other IP rights. And I've attempted to put that all on that uh, slide. And you can work that out because this is exactly where uh, I've tried to compress them all into those particular flow diagrams. But the one point that I would emphasize is where my diagram perhaps ran out of arrows or I thought it might look far too complicated is uh, at the bottom when I talk about stakeholder uh, consultations. I talk about that across, up and down, uh, and it's intended to cover a whole range of consultative processes between parts of government from groups outside that have particular interest in uh, IP matters. Uh, and one might need carefully to distinguish between the form of consultation that goes to a law reform body, which could be open and wide and general, uh, and the more limited consultations one might have at the policy implementation stage to remove the interest group interventions that have occurred in the past. So you might have more technical uh, consultations at that point. And of course, there's an extensive uh, lot of consultation that goes on already at the regulatory level uh, with the various user groups that IP Australia operates uh, in relation to patents, trademarks, designs. So I'm sorry I've gone a little bit over time, Andrew, this time, but uh, that's what I have to say. Uh, stay there for the moment, Sam. We're not letting you off just yet. We do have time for questions and comments, good amount of time for questions and comments. So I'll open it up for that. Uh, raise your hand. Um, a microphone will be brought to you. And it's probably helpful for Sam if you say your name and any organisation you're associated with before you ask your question or make your comment. So please, questions, comments. Uh, Professor, you said, although I hope I'm not putting words, oh, Neil Brown is my name, I'm a member of the Victorian Bar. <clears throat> I hope I'm not putting words into your mouth, but I understood you to say there was now, after all of this, no single ongoing research body continually looking at proposals. What about the universities? What's happening there? I had assumed they were busily beavering away on reform. Um, could you give us a brief rundown on what, what's happening there? Uh -huh. Well, that, that is true. There are uh, several research centres within uh, universities. In, in this university, IPREA, and uh, I think it's uh, at Griffith or Queensland, and uh, I'm not sure what the other one is, in, in a specific IP research centre there. So there is a, a lot of activity of that kind going on. And it's true to say that uh, with IPREA here, uh, that was funded, uh, at least in its initial uh, stage by IP Australia and other government departments. Um, that's that's good. That's fine. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that it's an adequate substitute for um, IP law reform at the public level. It is a public uh, engagement, I think, that needs to be uh, supported. 
Uh, Julie Stevens, solicitor. Thank you, Sam, for such a comprehensive review. It's a little bit depressing, isn't it, in some ways, where we're going as a country? What do, in your opinion, what do we need to do urgently to ensure and enhance innovation in Australia in terms of the issues you've raised tonight? To deal with all the issues you've raised could take another 100 years at the speed that we work with all of the politics. But do, if you were advising uh, the Prime Minister and the opposition tonight, what would you say to them based on where we sit in the world, the importance of innovation and all of the other issues that cir circle what you're discussing? Oh, th thank you, Julian. I, I have to emphasise this is only part of a much broader uh, set of issues that have to be addressed in relation to innovation. IP laws are just one part. And my concern would be to have the best IP laws that you can and uh, one way that I think uh, could be assist that process would be uh, that if there was some independent uh, reform body to which there are a number of difficult legal issues could be uh, referred, uh, that would be a significant start and hopefully that would flow through to better legislation and to more effective outcomes in terms of the innovation goals that we have. Uh, I actually made a list of uh, matters that probably fall into that category where we need actually uh, fairly detailed and thorough legal um, uh, analysis and research. Uh, uh, for example, in the area of patents, there's been a, a great deal of um, uh, discussion in the cases in recent year or so on the best method requirement. Now, it might be the case that that's... Uh, an interesting issue to debate, particularly if you're a barrister in court having to argue a case one way or the other. But uh, it might be relevant to ask, well, is this a requirement that other national laws have? May not be. Uh, if not, is it something we really need to have? And if we do think it's a good thing, how can we make that clear? And one way to assist that would be to have the analysis that is there. And it's probably asking too much of the current uh, policy groups within IP Australia to be looking at that because it's quite detailed, far-ranging research that would need to be done. But that would provide a, a quick, hopefully a, a swift answer in that particular area uh, if that could be done. Uh, other issues which one might look at, which are perhaps broader but might have still uh, quite wide-ranging uh, effects would be to look at issues, uh, again, of overlap in copyright designs, uh, private international law issues, uh, the various security interest provisions that we have in our IP legislation. I'm listing what seem to me to be peculiarly legal issues, which do need attention. Uh, so if you're thinking in terms of quick fixes, that might be a good way to go with an agenda of matters that could be dealt with uh, and could be translated into legislation. And a very good model uh, for reform along these sorts of lines would be uh, to have ultimately any report that's produced uh, to have a attached draft legislation. Uh, I must say, I found it more and more worrying in the last set of amendments uh, with raising the bar that there's a lot of reliance placed on explanatory memoranda and uh, comments in those as to what courts might or might not do. I don't know what courts will do, uh, and I suspect uh, no one else really does. They do need uh, directions, and they might be better provided in the legislation itself. And draft legislation is a very good way to go. And there are, there are as I say, there were models of that in relation to the older Knowles and uh, Dean Committee reports. So that, that might not be a very sexy answer, in terms of uh, uh, an immediate solution, but that would be uh, one way of dealing with a number of these outstanding issues. And hopefully that then contributes to our laws being better and, and simply being the vehicles by which we then promote these larger policy goals. My name is Meena Wahi and I specialize in intellectual property insurance. So my question is that in your map, stakeholder map, 
what, what would be the interface for um, other bodies like accounting standard setting bodies or regulators? Because as uh, an insurance professional, we feel that intellectual property is an asset, and where does it belong? And does does it have a place in the balance sheet? And in terms of intellectual property reform, do you see it headed that way? <laughs> Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, I realized um, you can see what an inexpert uh, uh, divisor of flow diagrams I am. <laughs> but um, I have been thinking uh, a lot about this question of consultation uh, and feedback, how you get uh, feedback into the relevant systems. Uh, and it does seem to me that uh, this exists at a number of different levels in the kind of framework I've suggested. And really what you're talking about uh, is the sort of input that should come at the reform level when new proposals are being considered. And uh, there are models for good consultation, I think, to be found in bodies like the Australian Law Reform Commission, which have been doing it for many years. Uh, so yours would be, that would be a natural inlet for you to, to follow. Uh, I'm a little less certain now that um, uh, I've thought more carefully about the policy implementation. So you have policy generation comes from outside, from the independent bodies. Then you do have a considerable policy role within government as to how you translate that into um, uh, legislation. I think that's important. And you do need to have some consultation at that point. Uh, at that stage, I think it has to be not uh, input from groups with an interest in an outcome as opposed to those who are more expert in uh, the legal and technical ramifications. And your background might be one which fits into that as well, that when you're designing uh, solutions as one would be uh, within uh, the, that part of the policy uh, group that uh, they get uh, proper input from bodies such as yours as to the design of the policy, but the policy itself should be clear what they're trying to achieve, um, which is why I would narrow uh, the consultation and the people from whom the consultation comes at that po point of implementation, which it, it de facto happens, it seems to me, uh, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, where bodies like the Law Council, IPTA, and, and so forth are asked to comment on uh, proposals as they are being implemented and they're going to legislation, <coughs> but not, I think, uh, on the policy uh, behind that. Uh, so that would be another point at which uh, input could come. And it might well be the insurance uh, aspect is, is one that's important technically that may not be achieving what uh, you might have thought was a good thing at the policy formulation stage. Hopefully, if whoever is doing the policy formulation in the independent IP reform body is assisted by <coughs> legislative drafters, there will be uh, materials uh, which will have uh, already taken a lot of those issues into account. So it's, it is, as someone said, in response to many questions, it is complicated and there's not going to be any perfect answer to it. <coughs> and some things presently are done quite well, some of them aren't. So we just try to do the better. Professor David Mentz, also a member of the Victorian Bar, um, you mentioned the petty patents and the uh, transmogrification into innovation patents. Yes. Um, I wondered if now that we are going to be seeing the repeal of this, if you could look into the crystal ball and tell us what you think the effect of uh, this will be. Ultimately the end of litigation in that area. <laughs> <laughs> um, I fear at a more, uh, more fundamental level, and, and this is going, going back to my uh, limited background a, 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 as a practitioner, that there are these gaps where people uh, want protection for something, and one might say as a matter of fairness or justice, uh, or at least uh, as a matter 
of ensuring that they have the incentive to continue to do what they're doing, they need some form of protection. And that's the very nub of the problem with petty patents uh, and previously utility patents and innovation patents, that they were intended to achieve something. And uh, we're not going to have that possibility any longer. They will have to go for uh, uh, full-blown patent protection with all the panoply of uh, conditions and preconditions that have to be satisfied for that. So um, uh, I can't help feeling that there will be a gap that will ar arise as a result, uh, but that's based on the best form of evidence which is anecdotal and intuitive subjective response. Uh, what would be really good would be to have a proper inquiry into uh, whether that is so, uh, what, what are the needs that could be served, uh, and how you would form it. And maybe we'd have to uh, move away from looking at Griffin and Isaacs and uh, innovative step and inventive steps and not very innovative and not very in inventive and uh, formulate something else. And there may be models to be found in other countries. And uh, to my knowledge, these systems, such as they are, seem to work well in some countries, uh, for example, Germany and Japan. I might be wrong. But we actually need to have that data before we can make decisions on that. Uh, my name is Michael Smith. I'm a patent attorney and solicitor. You mentioned, um, following on from the previous question, there might be a decrease in litigation uh, if the innovation patent is abolished. Well, it looks like, it. Look, look, looks like it's inevitable. Perhaps one way to um, increase litigation might be reform of courts, uh, in particular how we deal with patents mm. at the court level. The Federal Circuit Court currently doesn't have the jurisdiction uh, to hear patent matters. Do you have any thoughts in relation to um, perhaps broadening the ability for patents to be heard uh, by, by Federal Circuit Court or another body? I think I'm right in saying that uh, the body in which I'm involved, the Law Council, has always been opposed to the Federal Circuit Court having that uh, jurisdiction. And if I'm right, the kind of argument that is put forward is that uh, patents are very technical and uh, perhaps you need very clever judges to, uh, to deal with them. Uh, I won't comment on that one way or the other. Um, uh, it does seem to me that in countries where uh, procedures have worked more swiftly, a lot of it has to do with the particular attitude of the judges themselves. And you've seen probably examples of that in the United Kingdom. Uh, and you can spend an awful lot of time thinking about procedures and uh, uh, steps that have to be followed. Um, but a lot set does seem to depend on the judges being more proactive. I, I really shouldn't comment on all this because I'm no longer in practice, so I don't know what the uh, current state state is. But it is amazing to see the number of patent cases that are being conducted and reported. Uh, and... Uh, we're, we're lucky in the sense that we have judges who are able and capable of doing it. But uh, one of the issues, uh, uh, at least when you're teaching this material, is um, some of the judgments are extremely long and uh, difficult to uh, uh, compress and to work out uh, what one might need to teach students who will have to work with this on an everyday uh, basis. And, uh, of course, one of the issues there is... Um, uh, making them appeal proof uh, because it's easier to run an appeal than it is to run a trial and more cost effective. So I, I don't have any particular view on the Federal Circuit. I would have thought if you've got, uh, they deal with complex matters in other areas, I don't think patents are any different. So my immediate answer would be to say yes, that that would be a, a good idea. But um, I know that many of my colleagues would say that's not right. That's not the appropriate answer. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on Michael Schwager, the Director General of IP Australia, to bring this evening to a close. So, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm afraid I've only been given two minutes, um, and that feels like a terrible, terrible missed opportunity to respond um, in some considerable detail to um, some of the discussion and some of the, the, the um, ideas 
that we have had presented to us. I must say, I feel as though I've reached nirvana because um, this has been a fantastic discussion, um, largely because I was around for most of those innovation policy statements through successive governments since about um, 1998. Um, and at one point, I was responsible for innovation and IP policy in government. So, um, in some respects, I feel your pain of the, um, the history of, of some of this. Um, I should uh, just share with you that um, I was recently, I had the pleasure of being hosted to dinner by Francis Gurry uh, when I was at the General Assemblies at WIPO recently. Um, and I was sitting next to him having a lovely discussion. And I mentioned that I was going to be here at the Francis Gurry Memorial Lecture. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and he assured me it wasn't quite a memorial yet. Um, it was a pleasure to hear about the importance of an evidence base, and I think this goes to um, a lot of the discussion that we're taking place, uh, that's taking place certainly in government about making sure that we have the right evidence base and the academic and research community is absolutely essential for us um, to be able to make judgments in government about which way to go. Um, and certainly we would say at the moment, uh, the decision by the Senate today to repeal the innovation patent um, is based on what evidence we have. Um, hopefully, that means that when we have different evidence, if other opportunities come up and through our regular policy processes, including this, um, this, this schematic that I will take back to Canberra very happily, um, uh, further reform on IP law is possible. It's always possible. And to that end, I would recommend to you um, possibly one of the most transparent and open policy processes I have seen in my career, and that's IP Australia's policy register. Um, and there is an opportunity for anyone here to list policy issues, including the fantastic resources of all of those two bookcases, um, and to go through and pull out your favourite and register it on that policy <laughs> register, and that becomes part of our process of considering um, various reforms in the future to Australia's IP law or IP administration. And I seriously, seriously encourage you to do that. Um, so all of the work of the past decades is not lost. Um, we just need to make sure that the opportunity is there and the evidence base is there to achieve the reforms that um, others advocate and hopefully then convince um, the people that we elect to make those more reforms. Um, so there's been a huge amount of work here uh, and I really, really do enjoy uh, the, the discussion tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. It's a pleasure and um, it's an honour to be able to give a vote of thanks for your presentation today. Thank you.